idolizing of him and he'll have nothing of it. Which seems kind of strange. You know, you'd, you'd think Jesus would want people to really, you know, lift him up and think he's great. But the problem with being a celebrity or even an idol in the eyes of people is that it's far too small. You see, if you simply lift someone up as greater, um, you'll miss that he is actually God. And so as Jesus then opens the scroll of Isaiah, he himself finds the place in that letter, in that prophet's words where it says, you know, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim good news to the poor. And as he's reading, he says, all of these words are fulfilled in your hearing. Now, in case they had really missed because they were just so enamored by what he was saying, it began to sink in the significance. See, Jesus wasn't just saying that he's great. He was saying that the entire scripture from beginning to end is all about him. He is the one in Genesis who Having now broken everything to Adam and Eve, God promises one who will come and crush the head of the serpent. And Jesus demonstrated all of that. He's casting out demons. He's relieving people of that oppression. He's bringing freedom. He proclaims good news to the poor. That was one of the first things in his big recorded sermon on the mount. As he stands before thousands of people, he says to them, Blessed are the poor. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is the one who, who will restore the sight to the blind and, and so many other miracles because He is the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham that Abraham, you'll bless the world through your family. Well, Jesus is the one. And remember, He was crucified under King of the Jews. He will sit in that throne of King David and rule not only Israel, but the entire creation, the entire universe, forever and ever. And the evidence, he's not just asking you to believe this, as if, you know, you could muster up this kind of faith. He's asking you to know this by the facts, by the geography, by the eyewitness accounts, by the, by the artifacts that you can be uncovering in the scriptures. For Jesus invites us to go actually to the Jordan River and there you can see there is this Jordan River and to listen to the prophet uh, John as his witness the heavens opened the Holy Spirit descended on him in the form of a dove Jesus is the anointed he is the one just look at the scriptures of the healings the casting out of demons and then finally he summarizes all of this by saying the year of the Lord's favor has come this would ring in the ears of that first audience in Nazareth because every 50 years there was a jubilee year when all of the debts were returned and, and forgiven and all of the land that was owned by different families that had been sold was now returned to them. All of the wrongs made right. Jesus declares to them He is the one who's fulfilled all of this and now makes us right with God. They got it. Okay, they heard him. You're not our hero, you're God. And you could have heard a pin drop in that synagogue as then the fury begins to well up within them. I mean, who do you think you are? We grew up with you. We know you're Joseph's son. You're nothing that special. And Jesus made reference to two prophets who were sent to their own Jewish people and yet were unable to do anything for them. And so Jesus, here in his hometown, unable to give them any of the gifts that he has come to bring to everyone. You know, how, how did that happen? I mean, he went from hero to zero in one Sabbath sermon. I mean, normally we, we really hold up our heroes on a pedestal. And we want to emulate what they do and model our lives after what they say. We, we buy their memorabilia. You know, but the thing about even our heroes is they don't claim to be God, right? And if they did, we think they'd lost their mind. Like later today when Peyton Manning comes on television and he's not going to say to everyone, well, the reason I play so well is because I'm God. You know, it, 
Some people will believe that, but most of us will realize, wait a minute, he's just a human being like the rest of us. And, and, and even our heroes, as much as we idolize them, we also realize that so many of them have fallen from grace. I mean, they're not even decent human beings outside of their, their specialties in many cases, having been exposed to be liars and cheats and worse. That's the feeling in Nazareth. How sad. Jesus has now been exposed to be a liar, a cheat, someone that he's not, by his own words. And it's really too bad because, well, Jesus makes a really great hero. I mean, we love him, right? We, we try to be like Jesus. We recount his stats, you know, we relive his glory days and all the things that he used to do and, and every weekend we have a pep rally for him and we're singing his praises and shouting for him. And, but once you actually hear what he had to say in Nazareth from his own mouth about who he was, see, that that's when the music stops. The sermon comes to an awkward silence as you realize, wait a minute, you mean... He actually is claiming to be the Lord and God of all and of my life? See, until Jesus really comes into your personal space, into your living room to witness your conversations with your family and the malice and the contempt, and, and, until he, He's there in your bedroom, until He's there watching your check writing, until He's there on the couch watching the same televisions that your shows you're watching, until He's there watching you in your smartphone and what you're Snapchatting, and, and until He's really there, you can put Him up on the pedestal. He's the hero. We're all on His team. He's, yay, Jesus. And, but, but once He's invaded your personal space, you realize... Wait a minute, there cannot be two masters and lords of my life. You will hate one and you will love the other, which is yourself. Now it makes perfectly good sense why his hometown people drove him out and tried to throw him over a cliff. So do we. And, and what happened next really was far less dramatic than the events that led up to it. As they, as they pushed and shoved, and, and just imagine this for a moment. If you all got up and pushed and shoved me out of the sanctuary, out to the city limits, and if we had a hill in Kansas, I mean, just think of the, of the drama and, the, and how traumatic that would be for our children, and yet they were willing to do that and felt compelled by God to do that. Well, what happened next, of course, uh, Jesus just simply walked away. I mean, they, they had no real grasp on him. Uh, they could no more throw him over a cliff uh, than they could stop the sun from shining. Why? Because he really is the Son of God. The Father has declared, This is my Son, through whom I have created the heavens and the earth. This is my Son who will open your blind eyes, who will raise the dead, who will restore all of creation to its Garden of Eden status at the very end. You see, nobody takes his life from him. He has the power and authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up again. This Jesus, he is the one who's come into our synagogue, which means gathering place. He's the one who's come into our personal space. Not to rule and control us with all of his regulations. He's come to announce freedom to the poverty of our soul. That we might truly be set free from all of the burdens and the tears. Because every person here has some kind of tear and burden. And Jesus now has this limitless resource of God's love. You no longer have to live under your own steam, under your own abilities. Now you have this God who so loves you and, and comes to live in you in such a way that His power and His love and forgiveness are available and at hand now and forever. There will never be a time when Jesus is not on that throne ruling over the, the universe and your life. And He comes then 
with his freedom for the prisoners. And you might consider, well, how am I a slave to anyone? And yet, can you really ask that question when you're so, so bent out of shape if somebody makes a comment about how you're dressed or how you're looking today or, or what you're doing or how you're doing it? Are we really so free that from the desires that rage within us that no one else can see and yet they, we live with them every day? Are we really so free that the desperation of how much money we make and how much we really need and how much we really want, are we really so free? And yet Jesus comes to set us free from all of it. To once and for all declare of who we are, that we are loved. We have value apart from anything we do or say. And our sins are completely forgiven. The desires that rage within us. He who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. He is Lord and God. And it's not something you have to muster up your faith to believe. It's reality. It can be known as we know him. See, he's the one who finally opens our eyes to see the truth and such reality of where our help and our hope comes from. Our hope comes from the Lord. With this great and awesome God standing before us now, imagine him saying to you today, these words are fulfilled in your hearing. And then to live this way and to help you with that, today I have the third in my trilogy of sermons, a card to pick up. And it begins the same way that the other two have. That you would say every day to yourself that I am one in whom Christ dwells and in whom He delights. This isn't something you have to believe. It's something you come to know as you know Jesus. He truly does live in you. He truly delights in you. He's not just putting up with you. He's not annoyed with you. He delights in you. And having then locked in this first reality, then comes the request that, Jesus, you would show me my bondage and set me free to be yours. Most of the time, our slavery is kind of below the surface. We don't even realize what we're a slave to. And so we're asking Jesus to bring it to our consciousness that we might see and to realize the chains that are around our, our hearts and our hands and to realize He's the one who does set us free today because He dwells in us, because He loves us, because He's provided for us as the Son of God who has died and risen again. These words are fulfilled in your hearing. You may pick this card up as you leave the church. It's on the entryway table. Let us then stand.